uh, before starting of the program, I'll just request all of you to either switch off your phones or keep them on silent. And also we'll be live streaming our event and uh, we'll be posting it over social media and recording, is, recording it as well. So I hope you all have consent for that. So thank you once again for coming here. So welcome again to the launch of uh, Pune Se Pani, which is uh, an exhibition that celebrates Pune's waters hosted by the Living Waters Museum, a special initiative based at the Center for Water Research at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. There are several ways in which dialogue around water can, can take shape through academic practices, work on ground, education, as well as art. So today we are beginning our program with, with music and have one of our very own student, Vibhishan B, for performing this thing. Vibhishan is currently doing PhD in biology from ISR Pune. He started his formal training with Vijayalakshmi Shankar Narayanan and has been learning மழ தண்ணிய காத்திருந்த ஏரிக்கு 
பொறம்போக்குன்னு பேர் இருந்துச்சு மழை தண்ணிய காத்திருந்த ஏரிக்கு பொறம்போக்குன்னு பேர் இருந்துச்சு மாக பாம தபச தபச நிரி சமாக பமரி சதாபி எண்ணூறுல மின் நிலையம் கட்டினது பின்ன காத்துல ஆயிரம் ஏக்கர் சாம்பலாம் கண்ணு எண்ணூறுல மின் நிலையம் கட்டினது பின்ன காத்துல ஆயிரம் ஏக்கர் சாம்பலாம் கண்ணு கடலையும் நதியையும் பிரிச்சு வச்சா கடலையும் நதியையும் பிரிச்சு வச்சா வெள்ளவாத்த கருப்படேச்சா கடலையும் நதியையும் பிரிச்சு வச்சா வெள்ளவாத்த கருப்படேச்சா நிதபா மகரேரி சரி மாறி நிதபா மகரேரி சரி மாறி நிதபா மபதாபாரி சனிதச எண்ணூறுல செஞ்சு முடிச்ச உன்னூறுல செய்ய வருவன் எண்ணூறுல செஞ்சு முடிச்ச உன்னூறுல செய்ய வருவன் எண்ணூறுல செஞ்சு முடிச்ச உன்னூறுல செய்ய வருவன் கேள்வி கேட்டா மேக்கின்ந்தியான்னு வட சுடுவான் கேள்வி கேட்டா மேக்கின்ந்தியான்னு வட சுடுவான் கேள்வி கேட்டா மேக்கின்ந்தியான்னு வட சுடுவான் சாநித சரி மகரிசா நிதபா மபதாபமப கரிச நிரிசா மாதக மதப கரிச நிரிசா வளர்ச்சி வேலை வாய்ப்பு எல்லாம் வெட்டி சாக்கு ஏறி வித்தவனுக்கு ஏறி வெறும் புறம் போக்கு வளர்ச்சி வேலை வாய்ப்பு எல்லாம் வெட்டி சாக்கு ஏறி வித்தவனுக்கு ஏறி வெறும் புறம் போக்கு அப்ப நீயும் நானும் என்ன கணக்கு அப்ப நீயும் நானும் என்ன கணக்கு அடனியும் நானும் போறம் போக்கு அப்ப நீயும் நானும் என்ன கணக்கு அடனியும் நானும் போறம் போக்கு நானான் போறம் போக்கு நீ 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 புறம்போக்கா நானானா புறம்போக்கு நீ 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 புறம்போக்கா நானான் புறம்போக்கு Thank you so much, Vibhishan. Uh, to take the event forward, I'll, ni- I'll now hand it over to Dr. Sara Ahmed, who is an adjunct professor at uh, ISAR Pune and also the founder of uh, Living Waters Museum. Over to you. Yani, and um, welcome again, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to say a few words about why we're all here and what the Living Waters Museum is. It's a virtual museum that we launched in 2017 and basically working with young people across the country from the Northeast to Kerala to visualize our water heritage through stories, through new media, through uh, digital tools. When I say water heritage, I mean both built heritage, natural heritage and our cultural landscapes. We are a founder member of the global network of water museums, which uh, engages around the world. We have about 72 water museums right now in our network. And we recognize the soft power that museums have 
In 2018, UNESCO's Intergovernmental Hydrology Program endorsed the Global Net Network as a special initiative towards Sustainable Development Goal 6 on water and sanitation. I've just come back from the World Water Forum in Dakar in Senegal, where the focus this year is on groundwater, making the invisible visible. And in many ways, that kind of resonates with the work that water museums are doing, because I'm sure many of you have not heard of water museums. We are one of two in India. And many of you probably have not even heard or seen what a virtual museum is beyond borders. So since 2020, once the pandemic started, we've been focusing our attention on urban waterscapes, natural extension because attention because you were in lockdown mode. And uh, last year we launched Confluence, an exhibition that traces Mumbai's uh, water journeys from the ocean to the tanks and the old uh, water harvesting systems there to the rib, rib, rivers that flow through the city, the impact on uh, livelihoods, the uh, marine environment under our feet over there, um, culture and water, the stories around Zoroastrian wells and so forth. And it was a tremendous gathering of people that we worked with online, uh, conservation architects, urban planners, artists from the Kohli community, etc., to visualize this entire journey. And I engage, I mean, I invite you to also look at Confluence on the Live Living Waters uh, website. But we are here this evening to launch the story of Pune's waters. Uh, Pune's waters, which were once um, riv rivered for, for being sweet waters, and now now we are, you know, in a kind of, uh, I would say, an intersection between the river rejuvenation plans and the alternatives that are being posed around eco restoration, etc. As a museum, we take pride in bringing you stories that are well researched, that are well visualized, and invite you to make your own uh, opinions about, you know, the making of history around you. I want to um, uh, say before I move into the Pune exhibition launch, I also want to say that as a virtual museum, one of the things is that we are very flexible and we're able to work not only in Pune, but we have ongoing projects in Jodhpur with the um, Merangar Museum Trust on documenting their water heritage from the uh, patrons and ruled rulers and the Maharajas in Rajasthan right down to everyday practices in uh, Jodhpur around water. We are able to work in Calcutta and the Sundarbans, uh, building both a virtual climate wall and a physical climate wall uh, around mangrove species that local communities want in the Sundarbans. And now in Pune, we are uh, uh, celebrating this journey with all of you. So I want to before handing over to the um, di di director and to my co colleague Bijoy and to our eminent panel, I want to first of all thank a couple of people. Well, there are many people to thank, but I want to single out the studio vitamin D team, Parag and Ashwin are here for des designing the amazing website that you will see soon. I want to, um, yes, this is a big round of applause actually. I want to thank all our partners, the Center for Environment Education, Jeevat Nad Nadi, uh, the Intact Pune chapter, many, many more that you'll see over the course of the week as they come and speak. I want to thank our students, particularly our PhD students from uh, the Humanities and so Social Science Department at ISA and their faculty advisors, and of course, the Center for Water Research, which you will hear more about in a minute. But above all, I want to thank Chavi Mathur, who is the uh, cur curator of this exhibition. I wanted to say co-curator, but I think she uh, des deserves the kudos for being the main cur curator, holding the fort and doing a tremendous job. So a very, very warm round of applause for Chavi. And as a scientist, I think Chavi best reflects our efforts as a virtual museum in using the arts to communicate 
not only about water, but through water, other aspects of our everyday lives. And I think Chavi's passion to engage with micro museums, to engage with museums beyond walls is what uh, the Live, 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 Living Waters Museum is all about. So many of you student volunteers who have helped us in this past week, particularly Mamanus, where is he? Um, no, not you, sorry. <laughs> Manav, sorry, and I said Manas again. Manav, yes, you should be in the front so I can see. Sorry, Manas. Manav is our student volunteer leader. But I wanted to also invite the students as you are you return to the campus to please come and find us, get engaged with our work, see what stories you can do. Some of your friends here have already been working on content development, and we do pay for content development. We guide the process, we mentor it. And we also, uh, uh, you know, uh, pay you a small honorarium for your work. So I would, of course, like to also end by expressing my sincere thanks to the ICER lead leadership and the ICER management and all the deans here who have really cooperated and helped us in the last minute, last week or two to get this whole thing going. I think this is the first uh, external physical event happening in ICER after almost two years of being locked down. So it's been a bit of a challenge to get things going, but they are going. And with these words of welcome, I hand over to Professor uh, Giant Udgankar Ud Ud to the uh, head of the Institute to say a few words of welcome and to then launch the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so welcome to all of you. I see that quite a large number of you are from outside ISER, and I hope you have a chance to look around the campus uh, on your visit today or some other day. Uh, so the Living Waters Museum is associated with our Center for Water Research. And as we all know, water is really something very important for all of us. And for our survival, especially as urban creatures, uh, it's really something which we have to worry a lot about. And part of the reason why the Center of Water Research was set up in Pune by a group of faculty members, I believe there are 10 to 12 of them now uh, who are working in cons concert with each other, is to really address problems related to water in Pune in particular, but also in the country as a whole and in the world uh, on a larger scale. But in addition to scholarly work on water, uh, in addition to research work in, uh, on water, it's very important to really bring to the notice of the public, bring to the notice of our own students and our own faculty members, uh, the heritage of water at, in different parts of the country. Uh, the Living Waters Museum has been doing that and it's great that they chose, Sarah chose to be associated with ISA Pune a uh, year or two ago. Uh, so we have, they've done an exhibition on, on Mumbai's water and Punyat Sepani is really something worth looking at. I spent quite a bit of time this morning looking at the exhibition. It's already online uh, in the morning. And I learned a lot about Pune, which I just didn't know about despite being here for the last four and a half years, and also having made umpteen number of trips to Pune uh, in the years uh, before that. Uh, my experience of Pune water was somewhat, uh, I mean, was poor in the sense that I used to live in Mumbai as a young person, and you'd come Mumbai, there was no problem with water. You would come to Pune, visit relatives, and you know you had to have your bath before a particular time because the water would run out. And uh, the only other thing I knew about Pune water was about the big flood, which happened uh, in the 1965 or 64, right? 61, okay, somewhere around there. And uh, that was all that I knew about Pune's water or water problems. Of course, if you cross any of the six or seven bridges across the rivers in Pune, you will see and look down into the water bed, the river bed, you can see that you know a lot of work needs to be done in terms of cleanliness, in terms of perhaps the flowing of the water, et cetera. And uh, I hope 
things will improve, uh, both due to public awareness, which should be enhanced by uh, exhibits such as this, as well as by water research, uh, um, scholarly water research at ISA and, and other institutes in Pune also. Uh, so the Pune Knowledge for cl a Cluster, for example, is trying to do its bit to try and improve the water situation in Pune. Um, this exhibition is really fantastic. There's no other word for it. Um, it, you know, from Porite pipes. There's no Marathi word for pipes. <laughs> uh, 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 but it's, it's really something worthwhile, worth watching. I learned a lot about the geography of Pune. I learned a lot about the history of Pune just by looking at the various, uh, going down the uh, exhibit from stationary pieces of water to flowing water, etc. Uh, I read a lot. I mean, I saw, uh, so went to the part on the Ramnadi, mainly because I have a cousin who lives in a society called Ramnadi Society. And I always asked him, where is the Ramnadi? And uh, I still don't know where it is. It's, I think, a very small little uh, rivulet uh, near that society. But uh, if, if you go to the exhibit and what it's written, what is written about the Ramnadi, the importance of that and it's feeding into Pashan Lake is something, and the picture of Pashan Lake there is absolutely fantastic. It's got very nice photographs, this exhibit. Um, and uh, it's something which really stimulated uh, my mind. And I really thank Chavi and all others associated with putting this uh, exhibit together. Um, so uh, there, there are, it's really worth uh, looking at from the geography perspective, from the history perspective, and of course, from the perspective of people who want to learn about uh, what the problems of water and also about the water heritage of uh, Pune. So I don't really have much more to say. Uh, I'm listed as a speaker, but I'm not obviously a qualified speaker, at least qualified to speak on this topic. And I'm looking forward to the experts talk about uh, Pune's water heritage and the problems associated with it. So thank you and thank you for putting together a great exhibition. Yeah. I have to do this. The main idea was, as Sir said and pointed out, right, Nita, there are so many people with uh, researchers and uh, content creators, artists, they keep on working in their world, right? So this was a very nice attempt to get all the stories together. And our intent as designers was, how can we make it more, uh, more visual rather than getting it exhibition starts with the Pune map and the icons representing each and every story. Each. Yeah. So 
each icon represents a story and it, again there is slight engagement by adding animation and motion to it when you click on one of the icons you get the entry point for that particular story on the arch which is very kind of uh, identity of pune and once you enter uh, you have a cover picture of that particular representing that story the number and uh, you can also see the story in both language marathi and english so by default we have the english one and i just want to thank the marathi crowd i don't know if any of you are here but to thank you for translating these stories and really working very hard at that is anybody here from the north yeah and then we can uh, go through each of the stories with uh, again the intent was to make it more visual so if you see the images they have been justifiedly used large so that people can enjoy it visually as well <clears throat> and each and every story will have a related link as well like uh, we just passed the link uh, yeah like for example this particular story has a relation with some other story so there is a link where you can actually relate how these stories are you know interconnected with each other horizontally yeah so these are like mini stories within the story like there are at times there are complex network within the story itself right story madhe story kind of stuff so uh, we thought of having a horizontal scroll where while the uh, user is going through the story they can actually go through a kind of a mini uh, deviation from that story right <clears throat> and this happens seamlessly as you scroll you don't really have to uh, do anything separately <clears throat> there are some highlights that we have uh, used so that you know if people don't have time there are there are times that people like to just browse through right so we have tried to highlight certain part of the story which will still make sense um, when you look at it <clears throat> again each story uh, ends with proper references and uh, resources that are related to that story so you can um, browse more so uh, another thing to uh, notice is that uh, the uh, so i'll just go back so the story um, ramnadi it uh, story ends at the riparian zone where uh, ramnadi meets the mula river and uh, uh, another of our uh, partners jeevit nadi they have done an extensive study of the invertebrates at uh, at this uh, confluence so there are also these um, contextual linkages uh, uh, as the stories are um, the, the way they are organized so we have a few stories about the rivers the ramnadi story then goes into the invertebrate uh, story about the invertebrates and this is um, presented as a book by a science artist this is a person who's a uh, who's a researcher and and decided to tell more stories through her art so uh, this is presented as a book and you can also view it outside we have uh, a few uh, copies printed um so uh, there are different uh, kinds of engagement and uh, so uh, yeah so and uh, if we go back to the pashan lake story this is a virtual walk so i think some of you must be uh, familiar with the um, uh, gather town app which is used in conferences so the same app is very uh, nicely adapted for a pashan lake walk similarly we have another i have not pulled it up just for the, for time uh, to save time but uh, 
Pallavi, for example, uh, who's from the HSS department, she's made this interactive map that if you are in Pune, you can actually uh, see where you are in the map and, and see where you are if you were living in the Peshwa era, where are all the Uchavas and uh, Howards. And so, she, this is, so there's this beautiful interactive elements uh, that you will find as you go through the stories in addition to the, uh, yeah, to the images as well. Yeah, so you can explore uh, fantastic, interesting stories. For us as a studio, I think the best part was not the design of it, but learning so much going through the content. And for us, I mean, we, we are students ourselves. So it's great to learn about our beautiful city in, in a very different way, well-researched way. So looking forward to many more. <laughs> So thank you so much. I mean, really exciting site and please look at it on your phones or laptops. So now it's my pleasure to introduce my uh, good colleague, Professor Bijoy Thomas, also a, a water traveler like me and an economist and, and uh, currently the chair of the Center for Water Research and an associate professor in the humanities and social sciences department here at ISA. And Bijoy, over to you, and the panel can maybe join you here. Or yeah, thank you, Sarah. And um, so I would agree with Sarah that it's uh, so nice to see an in-person gathering after a long time. So last year, uh, we organized a series of water talks, and all of it uh, had to be held uh, online. Although we had a good participation for all the water talks, uh, it is always good to have in-person interaction and then live audience asking uh, live questions to you and seeing people face to face. So what I would, uh, I would not take much time. Um, I would, what I would do is I would just spend a couple of minutes um, just explaining to you what the Center for Water Research is working on <coughs> and what our objectives are. So we formed the Center for Water Research last year. Um, apparently for the inaugural talk, which was held around the time of the World Water Day last year, was delivered by uh, Dr. Himanshu Kulkarni himself, one of the panelists today. And um, so th this time we are having this event again um, after a World Water Day where we have uh, uh, exclusive focus on groundwater. So um, in the Center for Water Research, we uh, in the long run, what we plan to do is um, there are uh, multiple challenges in the water sector uh, in India. So one of the major gaps that we have identified is that there is um, lack of uh, capacity building and training especially among young researchers to think about water in an integrated fashion. So although there are multiple institutes and um, uh, organizations working around the water sector, so most of them op tend to operate in silos or work exclusively on uh, technological solutions or engineering solutions in spite of um, social scientists and historians and uh, people who work on art and culture associated with it. So we try to uh, have a change uh, uh, in this. So we would uh, draw expertise from uh, core sciences, which is a strength of ISA Pune. And also we have uh, humanities and social sciences and also uh, the Living Waters Museum, which is a special initiative in the Center for Water Research, all working together to um, make this um, uh, happen. So we plan to do this two couple of uh, ways. One, we have a research, which our faculty do. And uh, uh, we encourage faculty to do research in an integrated fashion uh, through collaboration especially across disciplines and across departments. And we also want to involve students in our research. So this is the second aspect of capacity building and also training the new generation to um, go into the water sector. So we already have uh, several students working with us on semester projects, uh, dissertation, master's dissertation projects, which is a one year uh, effort at ISAR Pune where you don't do anything else but focus exclusively on your uh, dissertation. So the third point, obviously, is the outreach uh, activities that the center do. We are in partnership and also we collaborate with many of the action agents in the city. And we also operate on a scale-up mode. We, um, so being in Pune, definitely um, our field and also our initial response uh, uh, is to the, the, the problems uh, which are faced by Pune and its, um, its people. 
So, but then we also have a scale up uh, vision in terms of looking at the more uh, larger scale, uh, looking at the, uh, the national and also global changes in terms of climate and other uh, events, which are uh, related to int intrinsic intrinsically related to water. So this is what the Center for Water Research does. So um, we welcome the students who are here to spread the message and also uh, join us in our uh, projects and also research. So coming to the, uh, to the topic for the panel discussion today. Um, so we are beginning a series of activities as part of the Punya Che Pani um, uh, events. Uh, so this is the first panel discussion, the inaugural panel discussion. And we have decided to focus the panel discussion on change makers. So these are people, um, all our three panelists are speakers who have been involved in the water sector in Pune for the last uh, several years, or decades rather and involved um, uh, either in bringing science to people and also society, or uh, in mobilizing community support for uh, the, uh, the challenges that Pune is facing. So I will not go into the, the details or the, the challenges that Pune is facing. I mean, if I start doing that, it would um, take a lot of time. I would rather let the, the panelists speak about that. But then uh, to put it very quickly, uh, in the last uh, say two three decades Pune city has seen a lot of uh, new changes especially in land use and also the way people interact with uh, the resources not just water but also the the civic space how things have been changing so this is one entry point to the current uh, uh, panel discussion uh, especially uh, we talked about the, the the big floods of the 1960s but then we also have been seeing sporad sporadic instances of floods especially the 2019 floods which is um, which actually um, gathered quite a bit of attention and then alarmed uh, civil society um, people and also um, scholars alike. And we have also some research ongoing on such aspects as well at the, at the Center for Water Research. So uh, the, the panelists today are um, uh, will be dealing with uh, these issues, uh, the challenges that Pune conference and also how they have been uh, making their effort in making some of these uh, changes happen at the cityscape. Uh, the first panelist is uh, Dr. Himanshu Kulkarni of Akodam. So one of the prominent uh, groundwater experts in India, perhaps I would say the, the, the most prominent groundwater experts in India, very actively involved in policy making and also engaging with communities. So in fact, he is known to take science uh, to community uh, participatory groundwater management and also has been quite influential in the yet to be released um, new water policy uh, of, of India. So the, the second panelist, uh, uh, Ms. Shailaja Deshpande, is associated with Jeevit Nadi uh, Living River Foundation. So, um, so many of you know her as a water warrior who, is, uh, completely, who has completely devoted her uh, life and energies to mobilizing people and also the community in and around Pune uh, to the healthy uh, rivers and also protecting the ecosystem of, uh, of rivers. So she will talk more about her activities uh, uh, with the Jivitnati community uh, when she speaks. And our last speaker is Dr. Sanskriti Menon with uh, CEE. So her interest, in fact, uh, spans quite a bit of uh, related areas in urban management, not just water. Uh, so she would also talk about the, uh, the different aspects that uh, the CEE has been working and what uh, she has been also doing, integrating many of these different sectors, waste management, water, and also other related uh, issues, including transportation and, and such issues. And um, so this is how the, the, the panel for today is set. So without much, uh, um, uh, much more elaboration of uh, the, the, the points, I would uh, first, um, so let us, let us go in this sequence as far as the panel is concerned. So first I would uh, request uh, Himanshu to speak, uh, followed by uh, uh, Sanskriti and finally Shailaja. And uh, so we expect that the speakers would spend uh, roughly around 10 minutes uh, for, to make the, to, for making their initial comments. So if there are really burning questions, we can take maybe a couple of questions uh, soon after the speaker uh, uh, ends uh, his or her presentation. But otherwise, we will uh, have the, the larger Q&A towards the end. So after all the speakers have finished their uh, initial remarks. So uh, Himanshu, over to you, please. I'll just maybe come down. 
not proper to be on stage when everyone stopped. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Udgalkar. Thank you, Bijoy, and thank you, everyone from ISER. Um, because Bijoy has given me 10 minutes, I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, I'll jump straight in. So uh, I don't think I'm a change maker who deserves the accolades um, that Bijoy talked about. I think it's, you know, I'm actually standing here before you as a consequence of the work that my organization has been doing for the last uh, 24, 25 years. Um, I have been a student of the subject of groundwater for the last 40 years now, a somewhat aging student. Um, that's a little bit about the organization. So we work on groundwater, we work on trying to communities close to their, to the res resource of groundwater, which is aquifers. Uh, all our work is based on partnership and collaboration. So unlike a lot of the NGO work where a lot of NGOs focus on either a topic or on an area, we work across India, we work with partners, 25, 26 years now, we have worked with about 400 different organizations across the country. We do a little bit of work outside India. So some work in Nepal, Bhutan, um, all focused on groundwater. And I say this with all humility because without partnerships, without collaborations, you can't take the work on water forward. It not be the domain of a single institution or entity. Um, next one, please. So um, what I've done is I've drawn from this experience and I will talk a little bit about the need for the interface between science, praxis, and policy. And to give you an example, uh, a lot of the work on science, and I'll take the example of groundwater, a lot of the science of groundwater, let's say uh, going back 30 years, was about locating sites for wells. A lot of geophysics went into that science. A lot of the, a lot of the education focused on the sourcing of groundwater in order to create access for communities to, for their livelihoods, for drinking water sources, and so on and so forth. Incidentally, India is the largest user of groundwater in the world today. And many of us in India were talking about this even in the 1990s. And it took NASA to bring out their report in 2008, well, actually started in 2004. And it took IVMI, you know, seminal scholars like Tushar Shah for India to wake up to this reality. Praxis, India has the largest number of wells in the world. My guess today is 50 million wells. And given that these wells belong to individuals, you know, people in cities and towns like Pune, but in the 650,000 villages in India, they are individual wells. And I think a lot of the groundwater usage comes from individual decisions. How do I use my own well? rather than collective community-led decisions. So I think unless this entire decision-making changes and people get into collective actions around the principles of common pool resources or water as a common pool resource, things will not change. Policy on water in India has always remained for many, many years in the domain of a top-down approach, uh, looking at regulation, legislation, command and control over water. I think it's important for us to bring these three together. I believe institutions like ISER can play a role in bringing, next one please, these three things together. The theme this year 
uh, the UN theme uh, for this year is groundwater. And they talk about making the uh, making visible the invisible. But I think what is increasingly uh, also coming um, to, to, to the fore, coming to the center stage, is the question of water governance. And I focus here on the question of groundwater governance and what does it mean. Next one, please. Just click, click three times. So I think when we think about bringing science, practice, and policy together, and Bijoy referred to the importance of transdisciplinary approaches towards this. I think it's only a transdisciplinary approach that can bring all of this together. At Aquidam, we try to work on the principle of bringing science, praxis, and policy together. Next one, please. To give you an example from Pune, you know, if you actually look at the hydrology of Pune, it's basically around two rivers. And that has been the focus of discussions all along. It still continues to be the focus of discussion for a Punekar, Maji Nadi. I, I remember a, a story that my mother used to tell me that, you know, I've, she said, you just you, you actually survived the flood of Pune by a whisker because apparently I don't remember anything. I was nine months old and she used to tell me that she stepped out of the house because somebody came, sh came shouting that there's a flood coming. The house was in, an, in Narayan Pet. So people who are familiar with Pune will realize uh, how severe it must have been. And the only uh, belongings that my father could salvage from that house, from that devastation, was my mother's certificates and his own certificates. So that's a small narrative, but it sort of remained in my mind. And it was always about the river. When we took up a study of Pune's aquifers um, over the last 10 years, we came up with a far more revealing narrative of Pune. And I think I could quickly, you know, this, this, this slide just, it was a quick view of one slide, which talked of the paradox of Pune's water. And it's come out of a study from very much within this organization. Is Pallavi here? Pallavi Gokhale? Yeah. So, Project Tadu. Yeah. So, so, I think there were a couple of very interesting studies that have come out of this entire system. And in some ways, the work on the wells of Pune itself is a paradox because you're sitting in a city, you're living in a city, which is a city of dams. Incidentally, Pune district has the largest density of dams in the world, in the world. And if someone talks about groundwater in a city like Pune, first of all, you're not welcome. Groundwater, what the hell? But if you look at the history of water in Pune, you find a very, very close relationship with, with wells. What about 15, 1500 and something wells going back to 1200 wells from 300 years ago. So is it really a city of rivers? That's a question I want to leave you with. But having said that, when we looked at Pune, and you can just click three times, we found that the growth of Pune city during the last 100 years has actually encroached upon two very important elements. There are 30 watersheds that bring water to Pune's rivers from within the city itself, 30 watersheds. And there are five shallow aquifers that underlie these 30 watersheds. 80% of so this is roughly pune today the outer circle nearly 90% of the natural recharge areas of the five aquifers which 1500 wells tapped for whatever 300 years 
and today we don't have i i think there are about 50000 wells in pune today nobody cares there are 50 points in the rivers of pune at which the watersheds these 30 odd watersheds bring water directly into the rivers we have identified somewhere between 50 to 100 natural springs again something which goes unnoticed in this story of pune as a pani but i think this is not just a story about pune this is a larger story of india this is a larger story at a global scale a story of ground water and maybe i'll you probably need to give me time and space to tell you that story as well but click once just click once yeah so i think urban growth has led to the neglect of watersheds and aquifers in cities like pune and it's necessary to bring in participative conservation and collective actions through especially when we look at groundwater through you know the work that we do across india involves what we call a protocol of groundwater management which leads to certain sets of outcomes on the efficient use of water on the equitable access to water which i think is going to be the biggest challenge the world will face in the years to come and therefore leading to the sustainable um, management and governance of water resources next i'll leave you with a uh, a kind of a new statement that we have thought about and it's not just a statement for pune or for a village in india or for that matter for for india as a country next just click but i think a new mission statement which we need to embrace one is india has a has had a long legacy of what are called the shallow unconfined aquifers ground water that is close to the surface you know just below the surface of the ground and we found that this particular entity the system has a close link to springs provides the link to why rivers remain alive throughout the year you know something called the base flow or the ecosystem flow in a river is linked to the shallow aquifer system below this must be kept intact second restoration of these shallow aquifers revival of these shallow aquifers is going to form one of the most challenging tasks in the years to come information and knowledge are important but demystification of information demystification of knowledge is the third point that i want to make and build policy through improved research and practice i i talked about this earlier i'll leave you with this last slide and if you want maybe we can come back to some of the questions i'm actually also supposed to deliver a talk uh, in the month of may in a conference in paris especially on 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 community governance on, on ground water and i have thought about the five p's and these are the five p's which have defined uh aquadams own work on groundwater in india and a little bit overseas i'll just list the five p's out first is the principle of principle surrounding common food pool resources second is people where you need to change human behavior if you need to understand um, or if you need to change how we look at the management and governance of water third is processes rather than targets and i actually like that bit sara about your water museum where it makes a very specific reference and i think even the the, the song earlier made a specific reference to processes rather than targets and i think in today's scenario if we get caught in this very queer maze of targets achieving targets we lose out on processes that are so important when we look at the heritage of water across the country practices that catalyze community decisions rather than individual decisions leading to collective action and last but not least policies that secure and sustain good practices 
and move away from a classical command and control approach to water, especially in India. We have tried in the, the draft water policy that I was part of, I was part of that committee, we have actually tried to get into the heart of a policy that will embrace good practices rather than stipulate a command and control approach to water governance in India. So with that, um, I'll end and I can come back to uh, some of the discussions later. Thank you, Bijoy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Himanshu. So if there are quick responses, we can maybe spend a couple of minutes on that. Um, otherwise, we'll move on to the next speaker. But before that, I thought I would um, um, just um, flag this point. Um, it is good that, uh, Himanshu, you talked about the key normative concerns underlying water governance. I think that's also a good point to begin uh, any discussion on water. So especially when we train the younger generation um, on, on tools and techniques, I think we oftentimes forget uh, why are we actually doing this and what are the aims or what are the normative goals of water governance or water management and the way you have put it the put the equity and efficiency and sustainability points uh, the key normative concerns are um, particularly important and i think that should set the tone for some of the discussion also uh, later on in the panel uh, so i welcome uh, Sans sanskriti <laughs> thanks uh, bijoy and uh, i'm so excited today actually with the museum uh, launch uh, because it gives so many materials which are uh, going to be there for the educational work that uh, shailaja and i and so many others are doing and himanshu of course and i have a, actually a small story about himanshu we met for the first time uh, in the late 90s Himan uh, himanshu i don't know if you remember and um, it was basically, uh, you know, we were uh, preparing for a teacher's workshop on water. And we used to have this, uh, that we would do activities over one or two days, and then ask the teachers to create their own uh, sort of lesson plans, which they would take back. And uh, one activity, I think maybe students may have done it in class also, is like you measure how much uh, a dripping tap uh, loses in a minute. And you'll see, fine, you'll see so many milliliters are lost, so many liters are lost, etc. And uh, Manju, at that point, said that, yeah, I mean, this is important, what you're saying, but, uh, you know, don't uh, oversimplify the thing. And uh, at that point, he said that, uh, I mean, you're not in your whole set of activities, there's nothing about groundwater. And uh, from, I mean, it really dates both of us that in the 90s, we were already, it was like 30 years ago, <laughs> starting to talk about these things. So, uh, but I think that lesson was important that um, uh, while we are talking about our use, let's not uh, oversimplify. And uh, the, you know, the idea of uh, education for sustainable development, environmental education, it was environmental education in the 90s. And we talk about education for sustainable development now. And uh, the idea of the ESD professional uh, is really to help uh, help uh, ourselves. I mean, whether it's uh, students in schools or teachers or uh, youth or community groups or decision makers actually deal with the complexity. And uh, uh, so what I thought uh, might be useful, at least for myself, uh, and I thought I'd share this as like a brief framework for uh, ESD, and I uh, thought that it should join, you know, like a confluence of uh, this thought process of the ESD framework for Punya Chepani, drawing also from the resources that are there, and then using it. And I was really happy with joy that, you know, the, the center here is looking at this outreach and action research based, um, uh, you know, process. And knowing also that um, uh, Sarah and uh, uh, others and team are involved in this uh, water curriculum. So I think there's a lot that we can do together. Of course, Shaila Jatta is already with her water warriors doing so much outreach. Um, and uh, so this kind of uh, picture, you know, which tries to show the interconnections and then the, uh, the, the framework that, uh, you know, I think we might comment on or discuss and articulate further is really to help us set those processes and strengthen the processes um, that are there of education and outreach. So just uh, if we take it uh, forward is, um, you know, so this first slide is like the first three steps of this uh, ESD framework is really 
um, knowing water as a social ecological system. And, uh, you know, uh, Professor Jayant, you said, like, I've heard the word Ramnadi. I know there's a Ramnagar. Where is Ramnadi? And I cross uh, bridges. And of course, people's own experience of water is water in the tap or seeing Nirmalya or looking at the river and feeling sorry. Um, but building from your own experience to uh, looking at its interconnections, okay, there was a flood. And yes, I mean, people in Ramnagar, they suffered life of uh, loss of life and property. Um, there is debris dumping. You read about cases. You read about the activists' concerns over, say, a riverfront uh, proposal or whatever. So the, the process is to be able to start drawing the interconnections between surface and ground, knowing that it is groundwater, in fact, feeding the surface. It is, in fact, the surface which feeds the ground. What is that interconnection? What is the connection between the peri-urban and the urban? And so this uh, Ramnadi story uh, had gone about 15 years ago, starting from Khatpewadi to the confluence. And then I did it again with my colleagues, the team, uh, in Jan and Feb to uh, refresh the story. And so much has changed. And so what has changed? Why has it changed? What can be the relationship of the upstream to the downstream? So these interconnections are things that the educator must, or this education process, the action research process might like to actually make visible. And uh, then uh, really look at how uh, the social ecological complex, because we are talking about water for well-being. We are talking about water not only for our well-being, but also for other creatures, biodiversity, for the ecosystem itself, and bringing that out. So this I feel is like a first three steps of understanding water as a social ecological complex. And the second is, um, you know, looking at the behavior of the system. So what has been the trend? And we heard this reference to the 1961 flood. We heard the reference that there were, the flooding incidents are becoming more and more. We can see the built up spaces in Pune. Uh, if you see the uh, time series uh, images, you can see how the built up has increased. And the concern that Himanshu brings in that, you know, the Bhavdhan area, which is great for recharge, is slowly getting built up. So what does that mean for urban planning? What does it mean for the development control rules? Uh, this afternoon, we had a discussion with MEDA. The Energy Conservation Building Code, you know, it is... Uh, not yet notified for Maharashtra. But unless we start looking at building practice, unless we start looking at not only, as Himanshu has been telling us, don't only look at plot-based recharge, you have to look at it at an area level. And you look at that uh, map and see that where you need a different kind of um, uh, urban planning uh, you know, rule to operate. Uh, so what has been the behavior and then can we, as a community, as a student group, et cetera, start looking into the future? Does the systems thinking ability that we want, uh, what will it enable us to do as a business as usual scenario? Can we look at another scenario? You know, uh, Can we look at a high growth scenario? Can we look at a conservation scenario? What do these look like? And what would be the result? You know, And then looking at the scenarios, can we start seeing that, okay, we have like very severe issues of well-being here. Are people being deprived? What is the equity? And uh, how can we address it? Does this square well that I leave my tap open or I draw water or I let out sewage? How does that square with my ethics? Is this okay for us? And then what is the ways in which we are able to do this collective decision making? And so uh, the second uh, slide was really the understanding the behavior of the system. And this uh, third set, which is learning to uh, learn and act together. And uh, really it is that looking at the system, that is it physical systems that we need to change? For example, uh, street design that uh, takes up a runoff water, filters it and recharges. Um, is it community recharge? So we are looking at stocks and flows. Or is it uh, certain types of rules where uh, we know that there is, just like the national water policy, there is a ground groundwater legislation which is pending its implementation in Maharashtra. So, uh, you know, and there are levels of 
things that we can do. We can learn from the inspiration, inspirational examples from other cities. I mean, Himanshu has been um, uh, instrumental in uh, working in uh, Rainbow Drive in Bangalore, where we learned that they have, you know, that's about uh, 300, 350 houses. It's a gated community. But from being, you know, a completely water tanker dependent society, because the city is not supplying water to that area, to becoming a water positive uh, uh, location. How did they manage to do that through their own research trials, uh, demand side management, etc. There are also in say Bhuj, a uh, set of uh, Bhujal Jankars who are advising uh, communities on how to uh, manage their water. So Pune could certainly learn from these examples and Pune has its own uh, great experiences that are emerging. So what can we learn from these inspirational stories? And finally, uh, we can learn from rural India in the watershed development program and participatory groundwater management experience of the last 20 to 20, 35 years and the traditional, uh, there is this wonderful book, Ajvi Kare Hai Tala, which uh, we can learn from and which we can uh, implement in uh, you know, the, uh, the current context. And so um, the, our, the educator's role or the, uh, what shall I say, the educational effort that we need to do is perhaps to, um, I would like to suggest or you know, invite comment and discussion on whether this could be a framework that we use for um, learning and acting together and actually set up the methods, whether it's a ward level group or it's a uh, you know, city level group or it's a, uh, some, you know, groups across different cities that we'll start to uh, learn and share. I think there are such groupings already that we could strengthen uh, this. And um, Vibhishan, right? Uh, that photo on the left, and it was really, I mean, I can understand a little bit of Tamil, though I'm a Punjabi. And uh, your, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that invocation really spoke to me because the architect who's worked on that, um, the, the photograph that, that's from Delhi. Uh, and they have worked on Jangli Maharaj Road in Pune. And uh, they, we are working together in North Chennai. And uh, Enor and the built up area in North Chennai and what you were speaking, um, it's, it's very much that, and what uh, Akash, uh, the architect of uh, that uh, uh, street design there, Akash, Sujata, Barkha and others, they've been talking about, uh, you know, groundwater swales and looking at um, runoff water uh, in street design to be taken into uh, water recharge pits and um, through uh, filtration so that pollutants also don't get in. And how this connects up to air quality. And um, I'm glad you said that I work in diverse fields and I try to bring them together and I've been trying to do that. And I, for me, it's really exciting to see because, you know, there are city action plans today. I mean, we have something called the National Clean Air Program. And uh, one uh, concern is uh, resuspended dust from roads. The solution given is let's pave it edge to edge. What does that mean for like vegetation on the side? What does it mean for uh, uh, runoff and rainwater, the speed of uh, runoff, which causes flash floods? We actually want to slow it down. And that's maybe the kind of design that um, we, we could be exploring. So the next three design, which is maybe going to happen in Pashan, can we actually look at the amount of water which comes down the Pashan Hill and see if the street design there can uh, integrate a better design. So uh, yeah, so that was it. And I'd really like to see if uh, you know this uh, resonates with people. Is there, is, is there like a framework that we could work with? And um, yeah, just, just that. Uh, I just want to share a small message from the sponsors, so to say. So this book, uh, 10 Steps from Systems Thinking, the cover of which I used as the opening slide, this is just, it's in print and it'll be there. And I think uh, there are lots of methods in there that we could try to use, you know, for um, deliberations and discussions and thinking about the future and looking at the past, et cetera. So yeah, thanks. So lots of uh, things to um, reflect on there. I mean, my takeaway from that would be the um, the angle of uh, urban periurban linkages that you talked about. At some point, if you have enough time, we could also discuss that. Because when we focus too much on the city, what we oftentimes overlook is that you know water flows through the gradient. There is upstream downstream linkages. So if we consume too much, I mean, we are actually depriving 
somebody downstream of their uh, due. So water is not created, actually it is only reallocated and that is something which as people in water resource management, scholars and practitioners that we need to be mindful about. So unless uh, there are um, quick questions, we will hear from Shalaja Deshpande about um, the water warriors story. Uh, over to you. I think I will prefer to stand here only. First of all, thank you, Dr. Sara, Dr. Udgavkar, Dr. Vijay, Himanshu. Everybody is doctor here except me. On today's panelist, probably I'm on the odd man out in an institute like ISER. But uh, I would like to talk to you or I would like to take you to the journey through which we went through when we started working on the waters of Pune. Mostly when before we made Dr. Himanshu Kulkarni, we really had very little knowledge about the groundwater. But when you look at the rivers, as Dr. Udgaukar mentioned, that the, the magnitude of the problem really makes you wonder whether the situation is going to change. And that was the question when we started working on this. And then we didn't know where to go, how to go about it, because the magnitude really makes a difference because people feel, how can I do all alone? What can I do? How, how to start, where to start, how to go about? And these were the questions when we started. And slowly we started getting answers towards the problem because the first thing we realized when we started working on it, that people do not know what is the source the water is coming from? What is that tap water? Where is it coming from? What is that river? Name of the river, what is supplying the water? And where is my waste water going? So it's a journey from water to water. And what is in between is the ecosystem which creates all this. So we realize that people do not understand the ecosystem. So sort of, we knew a little bit of ecosystems because we were the students when bunch of us, when we started about 20, 22 odd people, we were, uh, we had done a diploma. Uh, it's an inclusive diploma about sustainable water management from ecological society. And we were the restless souls. We always call that we are the restless souls because once you understand the ecosystems, you know, you have to do something about it. And that's how we started the work. And how do you make people understand about the ecosystem? It's the simple thing, the most valuable thing, air, water, and environment is not considered at all. But the most expensive and the costliest things are always given importance in any urban scenario. Changing of the handset, more advanced laptop, more branded shirts, but air, water, because it is free, we do not have the value. So how do we connect people to this? And we started looking on the internet and we realized that there is a World Water Day, which happens once a year, which is the last Sunday of every year in the month of September. So we launched first Muthai festival, a festival for the river, which, which was a week long festival where we did a lot of things. We had bird trails, we had flora trails, we went to the source of a region of Mutha river. We took the people around. We have an exhibition within the hall exhibition. We tried to do a lot of things. And that was the year we also realized that one event year, in a year is not going to be sufficient to bring the people closer, being more sensitive about it and we need to do more about it. So what do we do? And more than one and a half year, we researched about it and we created a script for Muthai River Walk, which is one and a half hours walk, which is digitized by vitamin D people. They have taken a lot of efforts. Now we had been working on that. And yesterday we had a lovely uh, river walk uh, through and thanks to Living Water Museum and ISER, a lot of people attended that walk. 
so that is a one and a half hours walk which talks to you about whatever himanshu sir mentioned whatever sanskriti said about the importance of the water the ground water how it is connected with the river what are the transformations which it takes and what is the current scenario and how i am responsible for this change so once we had so this is the river festival then we had the mo mobile exhibition which is about 40 42 boats which we started taking from school to school it's a pictorial story which we used to take it and lot of schools actually initially refused ye kya pani ke liye what is there just few minutes 10 minutes before prayers after prayers whatever time they could give we used to take two three bags along put this exhibition around explain the children the moment the children used to start looking at the bird pictures the flowers the fishes in the water the ship and shivaji maharaj they used to start asking question so that actually started giving us more confidence about it so that was the mobile exhibition i spoke about the river walk when we started the river walk we also started working on the actual on ground level under the program adopt a stretch closer to your place whatever the water body is start going there consistently start looking at that water body observe document create data and start looking at that water body differently then we realized one of the a few people came along to me and they said we have uh, seen a beautiful location and that was the confluence of ram and mura river which has a classic riparian zone and i was excited about it and i realized that in an urban scenario we need to start looking at the potential locations which could be restored by giving you know you just have to give the support and that's it but before that we worked as a family physician and the experts came along we knew what is the sick thing or what the river needs and we brought in the experts then icer people the scientists are coming and supporting us in different ways but that's what happened through nature walk so we started these nature walks because seeing is believing the river walk told them about the age of the river how it formed what happened through the river what happened in the ancient history history and everything but nature walk gave them that yes this is how the river should be restored this is how the river should look like these are the ecological processes when the river ecosystem goes through and we again are having this on weekends river walks and nature walks are always by registration which happen on weekends then another thing we had to work on is working on the west water how do you connect commonest of the common person to the river by making him understand that you can clean your river 60 to 70% from your own homes in short this is just a tagline to attract the people but basically it is a sustainable lifestyle in a common sense you try make them understand about the dry and wet garbage then changing to more natural and biodegradable products how do you go about it we started taking workshops orientation sessions and during last two years we have been very busy because on zoom it's been like every day we are having these sessions because everybody is asking about kaise karna hai kya karna hai that sort of a thing so we started working on the west water scenario how one can clean and that gives a connection are yaar i am using this biodegradable and natural products i it's a feel good factor it's a instant feel good factor a person takes otherwise the person is feeling guilty about it and that's what happened and then events by the river because everybody doesn't connect with all these programs you also need to create some events some events then it is always surat esa vahata in marathi we call it as sarita yan or poems on the river musical programs on the river classical programs on the river story and silence for the children 
because importance of silence is very important for the children in today's hub in today's fast life the silence teaches the children a lot of things so all these things we started working under events by the river which we have been continuing it and finally adopt the stage program actually opened us lot of avenues through which we again had many associations like himanshu sir which he spoke about we have been mapping lot of life springs along the river now which i was discussing with him just now that he needs to come to the site and have a look at it the biology of which the story came out because we saw the wetlands and the potential in the wetlands the littoral zones how do you protect how do you restore so these adopt a stretch programs actually created citizen science groups which you could link it between the scientists so we more or less became bridges between the science scientists and the common person where the citizen science groups started talking about it giving more and more sessions having more confidence and i think that's all i will end up here the rest in the questions but if you could show the last 2 minutes clip i would be happy thank you and i request all the panelists to just uh, come to the podium we can take questions from the from the audience so this event is also live streamed so we might also have some questions from possibly on youtube where it is live streamed so i think somebody is in charge of uh, collecting those questions uh, So I think Manav, you are in. You can pass around the mic. So definitely go ahead. No, just to kick off. So uh, Himanshu, just um, I mean we've been talking about it a bit also, but how do you really see uh, participatory groundwater? uh you know forums being created in the city of pune i mean is it better to do them aquifer based or is it better to do them 
uh, say electoral ward or administrative ward? I think it's best to do them in terms of how the opportunity presents itself. Because I, you know, I mean, even with our, our experience on participatory groundwater management in, in rural areas, we, we came up with a lot of surprises. I mean, we were able to tread a lot of ground with communities who we earlier thought might not be the most conducive communities to work with. So I think this, this sector is full of surprises, the domain is full of surprises. And I think rather than structuring everything in a very systematic way, it's good to be a little more intuitive um, on, 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 on the social fronts. Well, since um, all of you have been working with communities and also engaged with the government, so something which, um, um, which I think um, also needs some discussion and also reflection is to how to mobilize uh, these different actors um, who might have different interests in, in coming on board. Um, so although we are all um, for environmental conservation, so that when the government end, enters the scene or when a civil society organization enters the scene or when scientists approach um, um, uh, you know, um, NGOs for help in data collection and so on. Um, so how do you uh, manage these uh, different actors and, and their uh, uh, diverse uh, interests? And especially in working, uh, taking this message across to um, you know, people who are actually working on the ground and also the, the government agencies. Uh, so maybe Himanshu to begin with, or? No, maybe we can. Okay. Maybe because we are more on the ground. So <laughs> we know the commonest of the common people. But I think what triggers is uh, the desperation for the people. Uh, the flood affected areas, uh, if you reach out to the people about the why these floods are, uh, you are, people are suffering from, why is it happening? Or uh, why there is no water to in your well? What are the things? And if you start talking, but basically I feel it's a communication. There is a lot of communication and there is a lot of talking one needs to do. You really need to spend more and more energy on talking and communicating with people. And it takes time for people like us. Means it took one stretch. We had one of the toughest time in Aundgao uh, because uh, the stretch where there people never used to come. We the corporates were coming, the schools were coming, the colleges were coming, and we were looking at the primary stakeholders because there is a, more than 60 to 70 families of fishermen who are there, but they never used to budge. One year, they realized that he, uh, one fisherman came, kya tum log karte ho, kush nahi karte ho, filter nahi band hota. Filter is uh, the sewage treatment plant the STPs, which are there upstream, which are killing the rivers or the life, the aquatic life in the water. So I said, you join us and then we will take it forward. So then we wrote a letter, they took, they gave the signature from next time onwards, the STPs started getting monitored because these people became our eyes and ears. The vigilant monitoring system was created on their own by the fishermen. And now the next day we get the connection we get along with the photos. Now they also can GIS map those locations. So they are also clicking the photos with that, but it took us four years. So communication and communicating and getting them on board takes a lot of energy, I feel. Well, if you could also focus on maybe a specific case, uh, Sanskriti, because last year, um, I also had the opportunity to visit uh, the, the Mahodwadi site where um, Himanshu and um, you were working together. And also PMC was also involved in that um, uh, effort. So how do you, uh, so if you, care, if you can just focus on maybe that particular case and then uh, share your learnings from, uh, from it um, also for you know, the wider public, that would be really helpful. And um, both of you, in fact. Okay, so I mean, there, there, are, there are four things I would like to flag before I get to Mahmoud Wadi. First is 
taking off from what Shailaja said about communication, and I had written down the word communication. Um, yeah, as so, why do we need to communicate? What do we communicate? And how do we communicate? If you actually break these down, and if you are talking about the same um, issue or challenge with a different sets of stakeholders, then you have different answers to these three questions. I think what fascinates most people today is history. Interesting, I mean, the way it's, it's told. And I'm actually very happy, Sarah, that you have actually brought that history through uh, the Living Waters Museum to the city. But how the history is told is again a skill. You know, how do you tell history? I mean, for me, history is usually limited to, uh, to people and the heritage. But when, we, when I talk of groundwater, when we talk of groundwater in Aquadam, it's also about the history of aquifers, which is a far, far longer history. It goes back to the history of Earth. And bringing that history, bringing that history live uh, is equally important to a certain set of audiences. The third point is about change in behavior, because if you want to change human behavior, I think human behavior has to be aligned to system behavior, which is not in human hands. And it's a complex set of issues, this whole question of behavioral sciences. But it's really about the psychology of human beings around water. So that's the third point. And the fourth is bringing public into our system. The word public. I mean, public, I remember going to school and college. And public, the word public was used in a very, very negative sense. And, you know, the, the whole debate about public versus private is really the debate around which discussions or communication around water should be anchored. And one of the things which, you know, which, which stimulated this whole idea of public recharge was, well, it took off from our study of aquifers in Pune, but also from the study of Jivit Nadi or Sea's work, or even uh, an institution called Mission Groundwater, which talked about rainwater harvesting to recharge linkage. And we said, why are, why, I mean, it's very easy for the government to come up with a set of regulations and say, make rainwater harvesting in all housing societies compulsory. Easier said than done. But what is even more difficult is, okay, you can't, you can't take water from the, uh, from the rooftop and put it in the ground. You know, it's, 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 it's simplified and trivialized too much. I'll, I'll say this in Marathi because it has a very interesting impact. Marathi madhe bolta na ami asa manto ki sagla vartha chata vartha pani collect karon te zamini ta apne la kombai chai ka? Kombne has a very negative connotation to it. And if you look at the system behavior, it actually gives you a different message. Don't take up rainwater harvesting to recharge in every single location. Don't do it. The system will not allow you. So you need a strategic approach to recharge. And internationally, when we are talking about institutions in Pune are talking of something called managed aquifer recharge. How do you implement managed aquifer recharge in a city like Pune? And that was a takeoff point for the whole Mamadwadi effort, where we were able to bring together organizations working on the, on the ground, convince the municipality that this is where you can implement something called public recharge. So being, bringing back the word public with the positive connotation is really the message that we, that we want to give through our efforts. Very, very interesting point and also very challenging, um, in fact, in, in applying that. So do we have some questions from the, from the group or from online? 
so the other point uh, was also following up on uh, sanskriti's um, um, 10 minute uh, talk was also about the linkages with the city has uh, with the peri urban areas so in fact um, the last 10 15 years there has been a lot of emphasis on smart cities there was also a resilient cities idea which came up in the meanwhile which pune was also part of which is now i think uh, uh, not not there anymore so uh, how do the peri urban uh, interests uh, are getting factored in many of this work that uh, you know all of us do in the cityscape um, because the city get the water labor all kinds of uh, resources from the peri urban areas and then uh, often times when we focus too much on the city so just as just as i was trying to say we um, become somewhat blind to what is uh, happening downstream to the ecosystem to the river and also to people i mean farmers might be dependent on uh, maybe some level of waste water with you know nutrients for their crops and and so on so i've seen this in bangalore and um, part of my experience is also coming from question is also coming from my experience there so how do we bring in the peri urban interest also into the city uh, efforts uh no you welcome to also please share that what i uh, really like to uh, see is if it's possible and i think other organizations have also been trying to do these sort of river parliaments you know and looking at um, communities along uh, water courses um in in the smart city uh, while the smart city work was unfolding in pune um some uh, to draw on from another sector and to extend uh, an idea into uh, looking at how larger and larger communities could get involved so this uh, this idea draws really from the uh, the notion of citizens assemblies and today we have the electoral democracy system here right and uh, we elect uh, our representatives the idea of citizens assemblies is really to uh, undertake a process where we consider a problem as lay public and uh, you know with with an information base where we actually explore values and we've tried this and it's uh, i mean uh, the the uh, the process it's called deliberative democracy it's looking at lay people getting involved in uh, looking at issues and trying to influence uh, the formal uh, decision making process and i think that's the kind of um, um, process that we might actually like to do we've tried this in the smart city processes for street design in aunt you know looking at uh, okay so so who does the street actually belong to i mean is it uh, is it uh, for only cars or uh, motorbikes or Uh, you know do uh, pedestrians have some claim to the space or not and uh, don't street vendors have a claim to the space and the children who are walking and the uh, uh, street vendors and waste pickers so looking at a uh, uh, street is a very complex uh, uh, situation into which people would like to have a say and then uh, you know taking what people have discussed into the formal uh, decision making process i think these are sort of similar uh, there is experience from the rural areas now how can we have an urban rural dialogue that maybe we should do a citizen assembly around that not only upstream of pune but also downstream of pune and why should it be about pune as such of course we are a very big entity in you know this uh, system but uh, it would be good to have citizens from upstream downstream peri urban urban uh, talking about punya chipani together to say that what do we make of uh, you know the situation that we have so far so but uh, shelaja you want to just add on to that go ahead hello Yeah, thank you for the wonderful discussion so uh, this is an era of technology and uh, so generally solutions are also directed with technologies and three of you are working in the social aspect of all like the questions that we discussed so when you are actually working on ground how do you uh, manage that balance or how do you strike that balance and also when we say community it's not a homogeneous unit so how do you actually deliver it to different kinds of people when they actually want to do something about say river or ground water system yeah so technology is a whole bunch of things i mean you could you could use technology in different ways right now much of the effort on technology goes towards trying to solve a problem but getting to understand the problem itself requires technology or can technology can be 
put to good use. I think we've also narrowly put technology in a particular box of solving problems. I think if you take technology out of that box and use it in many more ways, it has far, far bigger and more useful applications than where it is now. I'll give you a very small example on, uh, because there was a reference to socio, socio ecology. So we, we do a lot of mapping of aquifers. And I think we are the only entity in the country which does the least invasive mapping of aquifers. We don't use any geophysics. We don't use any instrumentation. We simply base our aquifer mapping on the power of observation. And we are actually have developed a seven step methodology of using the power of observation to actually map aquifers. I mean, we use a little bit of the technology in terms of say collecting data where you could, everyone has a smartphone today. You can actually use a smartphone to build this entire story of an aquifer, to build the entire morphology of an aquifer. And we talk to people. So again, communication with people on the ground with, with communities helps us build this story. And we therefore use technology in a very strategic way. That's the limited sort of response I can give you at the moment. I, I just wanted to uh, maybe uh, think about uh, you know the word that you used. Uh, the idea is not to deliver education at all, actually. And I think because the answers, maybe there are some learnings from um, different experiences. There are efforts to uh, make uh, the knowledge base uh, more uh, more robust. But I think what we are trying to do is actually evolve the processes of learning and acting together. We don't have ready-made solutions. These are uh, experiences that we are actually undergoing now in our present day time, and we are trying to deal with them. And uh, I think the learning that we can draw is that it does require the experience and knowledge of all these people in our city together and you know who are connected to this. And how can, how can we create a process in which people's knowledge and experience can be brought together and how can we just like you know rivers have confluences or water has confluences our knowledge and experience and putting it together maybe clarifying underlying values making even the values visible uh, i think that is the process that we want to create and engage in and make stronger I mean, one that we are running out of time, um, but then one one final question from my side. Yeah, I think Radhika has a question. So one question is by Niharika Shaha. She asks, can you please explain about the watershed management practices to recharge groundwater and how are they different in urban and rural context? And also how, how we as common man take part in it? Uh, that's one question. Another question is by Anita ma'am. She's asking, given the urban growth of Pune city and inclusion of many villages in the PMC, what challenges you have to come across while working for projects such as revitalizing water aquifers? Yeah, so Himanshu first probably. Yeah, so I think a, a very quick response to the watershed management question. I mean, it's to, to put it very simply, you are in the rural space, you're essentially working in a natural watershed, in, in a watershed which is in its natural state uh, with very little built up, uh, built up area. In the urban space, it's all built up. So your watershed area itself is built up, your aquifers or the recharge areas for the aquifers are built up. So you need somewhat different strategies in these two contexts. I won't we don't have the time to get into those strategies. But I think in both, what is common to both is a proper understanding of the watersheds themselves, a proper understanding of the aquifers that underlie the watersheds and the interrelationship between these two uh, to work out the different strategies. Uh, 
in terms of the second question i didn't really get the full question completely can you just repeat that radhika right right given the urban growth of pune city and inclusion of many villages in the pmc what challenges you have come across while working for projects such as revitalizing water aquifers i'll just turn this question around and answer it in terms of opportunities so by giving you a, a live example in fact the day after tomorrow i am visiting a few of these areas along with the pmc team because what after having interacted with them for many years now with sanskriti's help they have come to us and said okay these are the whatever 20 odd villages that will be included in the new uh, new plan can you tell us which are the areas in these villages which are still pretty much half rural half urban so which are the areas in these villages which we need to protect so i think this entire communication with the powers that be over the last few years has yielded this result so if we can bring this new paradigm of protecting the natural recharge areas in such such areas that are now coming into the city limits i think it will be a new uh, new entry for the smart city paradigm that everyone is talking about so yes there are challenges but i think you can convert those challenges into new newer opportunities i think you need a lot more in terms of knowledge in terms of understanding of aquifers in a growing city i would stop at that and i think that is perhaps the starting point for building newer forms of communication with with different stakeholders in a city like pune i have a question because uh, i have been told it's getting yeah the late. last question was yeah. very quick uh, questions so one is uh, related to the place we are currently sitting at uh, i mean going by your talks it was clear that uh, there has been a significant amount of work done by three of you and all your organizations spanning science governance education and action uh, given that uh, what role do you see a place like iser playing uh, that is question one and the second thing when it comes to participatory governance or community governance uh, one also needs to develop a sense of communal identity uh, which is so again in the context of uh, this particular thing uh, have you in your experience seen the arts uh being playing a role in building this community identity or has it been mainly problem based or issue based uh development uh, of this kind of an identity yeah so the role of iser and um similar in sir so what can we do Uh, no i think there are at least two three types of roles certainly one i think uh, uh, from the aquifer studies by uh, aquadam it should reveal what uh, what the potential of the campus itself is in terms of water management um, and water recharge and the other is of course the 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 work that is happening as an institution and uh, looking at uh, ways uh, with the center for water research and uh, action looking at studies looking at maybe um, student and faculty um, action research really and uh, uh, whether it's uh, the the social uh, dimensions or uh, the um, mapping and uh, you know uh, other uh, technology kind of dimensions but i think there's we should talk about uh, what what could be the um, you know uh, common sort of agenda and there are many uh, many things to do in that it would be really nice to have um, uh, this uh, the citizens assembly that i'm talking about looking at uh, could 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 this be actually convened it takes uh, quite a lot of human resource to uh, uh, you know put together the information base that needs to be uh, put out there for deliberation and to curate the deliberation process so if there's a possibility of actually doing that 
then uh, that that would be uh, wonderful yeah yeah i would like to add into that because we are we do face some ground uh, issues uh, while doing our work one is analytical studies which whatever we we do the research we need the analysis to be done suppose when we are talking about you must use biodegradable and natural products then life cycle analysis of each and every product makes a lot of difference see it is convincible if it is scientifically proven to the people in front of them and if a, a scientific community tries to do we have taken scientific background and support from the people but we are not the scientists so this makes a more convincible to a particular sector of community suppose we go to the corporate sector on what basis you are saying is something the question if that is asked the common people will not ask they will say yes ye mere ko pata hai ghar ke bahar agar aloo lagaya hai to pani filter ho jata hai that they know by experience but certain people are very hard they would really like to um, make these facts very clear and that's where probably i said community would pitch in whether it is in the social context whether it is in the wastewater scenario or uh, research regarding the ecological processes or urban rivers and rural rivers both rivers are having similar problems but there are lot of potential areas which could be restored and if there is a scientific backing uh, for support i think we can do a much more uh, better job because you need not really come need not come to the river every day and day out we are there to create that data if once you give us the system the people working the volunteers will do the rest of the job but the analysis needs to be done so these things are really important for us uh, to take uh, the restoration works forward i think uh, sorry uh, just take a minute more uh, isor has played a very key anchoring role in uh, something called the maharashtra gene bank which is this uh, distributed statewide uh, community science uh, biodiversity conservation work that has been done and she has been part of this 15 organizations with um, uh, in different parts which are doing in situ biodiversity uh, conservation work and i think there's a lot of learning from that you know how to hold together a network and um, back it up with uh, uh, the anchoring that is necessary for such a network well i can't really help myself i'll make three points um, especially with your question first is i think uh, you know one of the big changes we need in this country is to change education and research on water i think we have to move away from this classical mystified world of education and research i mean for instance i mean how many people in this room probably about 50 60 not more if for example you had a session on interlinking of rivers you would probably have required a room which would be 10 times this and that's because there's a certain aura to certain subjects which unfortunately still lingers in our mainstream education similarly the way education is delivered you know somebody who speaks from a podium you have 100 people in a room and most of what she or he speaks those 100 people don't understand he is labeled as a great orator but if someone who simplifies those things and if all 100 people in the room understand he is labeled as a commoner i think this stems from the fundamentals of how we look at education and research in this country i think we need to change that and if i were to give a message to i sir unwanted unwarranted i would actually say change this whole system i've come i've actually come out of that system 30 years ago fundamentally because of this problem that's one so that probably answers the your first question the second again is a an answer that may be sound may, may sound disruptive why do we need an identity at all i think we should move away from this whole notion of identity in order to resolve this identity crisis which play, which plagues water today i mean i was joking with rajendra singh one day sara 
and i asked him why are people calling you the water man of india so he laughed he said i don't know i said why what don't you find there's a gender issue there when you are labeled as a water man of india i mean why what is what is so masculine about that i mean do you feel so you know it went on it went into a joke but i think it's really about doing away with the identity and i think by doing away with the individual identity we bring the community to the forefront i know it's challenging last but not least one of the best pieces of literature which i could not treasure was a book that i bought for my daughter when she was in class 1 or class 2 it was a set of poems not very well known poems by kusuma graj and there were 10 or 12 poems on the environment just you know short four liners five liners i think that i mean i i talk to a lot of my musician friends i don't know if i talk to you about that um when you were there as an intern as you know can somebody provide music to those poems which will create a much 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 bigger impact i remember it was a book produced by navneet i'm still trying to locate if i can get my hands on that book it had one of the best messages on water and environment that i've read today i think something along those lines rather than thinking very very abstract i think art also has to come out of the abstract closet and talk to common folk like me so th- thank you thank you very much himanshu well i don't want to be labeled as a bad moderator the session has already overshot uh, more than half an hour but it was a very lively discussion and debate and thank you all of you for joining and also people who are uh, online on youtube i hope you can all join us for the remaining three panel discussion and also the other events and we look forward to meeting you all physically on campus uh, feel free to come and meet with us and engage with us in our uh, work thank you very much thank you all